Acts chapter 16. And uh, we, we see the beginning of the, the second missionary journey of Paul, this time leaving Barnabas behind and, and taking along with him Silas to go back to the places where he had been on the first missionary journey to confirm those churches, going through Galatia and the southern part of, what, of Asia, which is, which is today Turkey. And so now today, we see him, as he's leaving, we, we see him going through the region, as it says in verse number six, through Phrygia and Pamphylia, those areas in Galatia, and we'll see that he has stopped from going into what the Bible says, Asia. Well, how did that happen? He was already in Asia. There were certain parts of Asia where the Spirit prevented him from going to. And there's, there's good reason why he didn't go to, and we'll look at that, at that this morning, and as well as his trip in what we call, we saw it today, we, we listened to it, we've heard that Macedonian call today. He has this vision of, of somebody from Macedonia that says, come help us. And it's interesting in Macedonia and the region around there, it's interesting because they, they had no... Uh, Jewish synagogues. There was no Jewish presence in Macedonia of all places. And uh, it's kind of neat how that happens. But let's read this morning to start off. Let's just read uh, chapter 16 and let's just read through uh, verse 12 this morning. Uh, Acts chapter 16. Actually, let's start in, in chapter 15, the last verse, 1541. It says, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the, church, were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Phrygia, in the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After that were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, or Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia, and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we're in that city abiding certain days. And Lord, we just pray that you would add your blessing to your word this morning, and we do pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So it's interesting. It's always been an interesting part of, part of the scriptures. Why? Why was Paul forbidden by the Spirit to go into the, these certain parts of Asia. We're going to look at the scriptures and see part of that. But verse 6 says this, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Gal Galatia, right? This is the same region where he had covered on that first missionary journey. This is where, when the book of the Galatians was, was written, which contrary to m much opinion today, Galatians was more than likely the first epistle written by Paul. 
And then a lot of people say Thessalonians, but we'll see that he didn't write the Thessalonians until after Philippians. So we have Galatians, Philippians, and then Thessalonians. This is the order in which he visited those areas. And, and it's interesting, a lot of the epistles were, were written from Philippi, which we're gonna be looking at, at soon. An interesting place nonetheless. So they were forbidden. He was forbidden to preach the word uh, in Asia. How, why, why could that be? Anybody have any ideas? I mean, the, the Spirit has a better idea than we do. But the, the, it's in... Hmm? It's a province of Rome. Yeah, it's a, the, the, kind of the whole area was a province of Rome then. And Paul had, Paul had free, free access to Rome, Roman areas because he was a Roman citizen. But why th this particular region? If I had a big map, I could show a little easier, but you have to kind of picture it in your mind. Picture the country of Turkey today. On the northwestern side of Turkey, the northwestern part of Turkey, as well as northern Turkey, uh, we have Istanbul, not Constantinople, you know, which was Byzantium at the time, was up in the northwest corner, and that whole region up that way and across the north coast of modern day Turkey was the area Paul couldn't, couldn't go into. He was, he was not permitted to go to. And, and the regions south of there in Galatia with Phrygia and Pamphylia, he was able to go to, he visited those areas, but here he wasn't allowed to go by the Spirit. So the Spirit would move him off, say he looked to go through Mycenae and passed by Mycenae and went off into Troas. Let's look at a couple places. Let's go to, back to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And this will be written after the fact here. But I think the concept and the idea is here. Romans chapter 15. And I'm looking near the, the end of the chapter here. Verse number. Yeah, let's, let's start at verse 14 here. I want to look specifically at verse 20. But verse 14 of Romans 15 says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Again, there was a separation back in Acts 13 that Paul would go to the Gentiles, he would, he, and Peter would be the apostle to the Jews. Something to keep in mind here. Uh, that I should be, of verse 17, I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of these things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now, let me, let, me, let me look at verse number 19 for a second. Elycrium or Elysrium is the region of Croatia today. It, it is across the Adriatic Sea from Italy. So if you're looking at the, the east coast of Italy and looking across, you're looking at Croatia. You're looking in the Balkans there. So Paul is saying that I have started from Jerusalem and have brought the, the gospel round about through the entire region. And, and uh, so now verse 20, so I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He's gone into places where no man has gone before with the gospel of Christ. 
Now look at verse 20. It says, Yea, so have I, have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Verse 21, But as it is written, To whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they have not heard, shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. You know, in, in Rome. But now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, where, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be wrought, brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled uh, with your company. But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. Verse 26, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. I'm going to stop right there for a second. Again, Paul's desire after the second missionary journey was his desire was get, to get back into Jerusalem. Yes, he didn't have the gospel of the Jews going to the Gentiles, but still him as a, a, as a Jew of Jews still desired to get back. And after, at the end of the second missionary journey, he, what's the word that we used to use? He booked it back. Remember that old word? You know, booked it. Younger kids might not remember that, but he booked it from, from Ephesus all the way back to Jerusalem so he could get back and minister on the feast days in Jerusalem. But, going back to verse 20, which was the real place I wanted to get to, look what it says. So I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. So I'm going to put this, I'm going to put this, uh, is it an assumption? I'm going to put this assumption out there that Paul did not go to those portions of Asia because the message had already gotten there. Now, if we remember through history, remember the first place that Paul usually goes into a city. First place is the synagogue. All right? Northern Turkey, and as well as Eastern Turkey, if you think of the seven churches of Revelation, they are actually seven Jewish assemblies in the book of Revelation. They are the synagogue, not the synagogue of the Jews, but the synagogue of Satan. In, in Thyatira, all these things, all these things actually lead up to the tribulation. That's what it'll end up being. But let's go for a second to First Peter. First Peter, I, I think will will uh, shed some more light. Now remember, First Peter. Peter is addressing. He says who he, he's addressing in the first part of chapter one. He's addressing the dispersed Jews, the believing Jews who were dispersed. In, in the timeline of prophecy, we'll see 1 Peter and 2 Peter fully realized after the rapture, after the church is gone. Keep that in mind. But look at the beginning. I find this fascinating. Verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered... All right, the strangers scattered. They'd been, after the, the in around 60, 66 AD, even be believing Jews, believers of all sorts, were scattered throughout the world with, 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 the, uh, with the persecution. Earlier on, after the Babylonian captivity, many people stayed scattered in the diaspora. That's why you have so many synagogues throughout Turkey. Uh, what's known as Turkey today. But look at these names here. To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We're going to see Bithynia in Acts chapter 16 as well. Bithynian, Bithynia is the, the region in Turkey today that is the region where Constantinople or Istanbul, not Constantinople, is today. We'll see that area Paul was not permitted to go to. So 
here's what I think. Go back to first, go back to, oh, wait, let's finish this verse here. The elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. So, so Paul, uh, Peter here is given this, this, this commendation to those who were scattered in these areas. This whole, these, all these areas, he says Galatia here, Paul did go into Galatia. He went into southern Galatia. Galatia was so, so many times changed, northern Galatia, southern Galatia, different districts in Galatia. But Galatia would go from the very northern part of Turkey down to almost the southern part where Pamphylia met it. So what is happening here is Peter is addressing these same areas where Paul was not forbidden to go. So Peter was the one whose foundation Paul would not build upon. Now, now it's something else interesting. Let's go to 1 uh, Peter chapter number 5. I know we've gone through this before. And this ties it all together. Verse number 12 by Silvanus, this is Silas, who also was a cohort of Paul. Silas was with Paul on the second missionary trip. Silas would stay out on the field. I believe he ended up being with Peter. And look what happens. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. The church that is at Babylon, church that is, is in parentheses. Uh, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. So there's John Mark, who had been left, and in, in Silas are together with Peter. Now this church, which is at Babylon, many people believe that this was code word for, for Jerusalem. Some believe it was a code word for Rome, but I believe that what Babylon he's talking about is Babylon. Literally Babylon. Because during the, during the Babylonian captivity, there were still some that stayed there. Babylon was a th pretty much a thriving, uh, not a major city, but it was a, a pretty good size city throughout the years up until like the early 1900s. So it was there. So that covers the entire northern region of Asia, Peter's ministry there. And it's amazing how that, if you look at the seven churches, the book of Revelation, in Revelations, uh, Revelation 2 and 3, you'll see only one where Paul ministered to, or at least it's written that he did, and that was to Ephesus, a major commercial center of Asia. And it's amazing how that happens. So the, he was, I believe he was, and I say I believe because nobody really knows for sure that Paul was forbidden to go to the, that region because Peter had laid the foundation there for the church during the end times. When the body of Christ is gone, that will be a thriving area of, of believers then. So let's go back to Acts chapter 16 and kind of piece that back together. Acts 16, verse number 6. All right, that's 15, not 16, so... So verse number six, once again, now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. 
Didn't we just see Bithynia along with Cappadocia and Pontus and all those, re all those places that are in northern Turkey today? So they went to go into Bithynia. You know, of course, that would bring them to the biggest port of all to get uh, to bring the message. The biggest city of all in that area would be Byzantium in Bithynia. And uh, even it, now I'm just kind of thinking on my feet here. I'm thinking today, what was the, the seat of power during, during the Roman Empire after Rome? It was Constantinople. That's where even the church was divided between East and West in the Catholic Church. And, and even they took Peter as being the foundation of that blasphemous organization. So a lot ties to, to Byzantium. But nonetheless, they wanted to go into Bithynia. You know, but the Spirit told them no. And they will come to Mycenae, they, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by uh, Mycenae, came down to Troas. So they kind of did a left turn. They went down the coast into Troas, which would be the, the major port of that area. After Byzantium, where they were, pre uh, where they were prevented from going. That woke me up where they were, presented, they were prevented from going, they came down to Troas. Interesting, Troas, too, it sounds a lot like Troy. Think of Alexander the Great and the Trojan Wars, and, and think of the, uh, the Trojan horse. All this stuff took place in Troy. But Troas, at this time, was more modern. It's actually still a modern seaport there today. And this would be the, the most direct access to get over into Macedonia. Now, even I, I wish I wish uh, Deanna were here because she comes from a place that's neighboring and was part of Mass, ancient Macedonia, Bulgaria, and uh, could could actually go through the geography a little better. They they were called to go into Macedonia. Let's look at this here now. And they they passing by Mycenae came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. So they're at Troas. They're there, not really knowing exactly what they're doing in Troas, only that it was a major city. They were prevented from going to the place where they, they believed would be the proper place to go, into Byzantium, in, in the region of Bithynia. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Now, we don't know if he was sleeping, whether he was awake, how he had this vision. This is, again, one of these things that's not a pattern for us today, that if we wait and go, oh, we're going to get a calling from the Lord. Nothing like that. Paul had revelation from God himself somehow of this. There stood a man of where? Of Macedonia. How did Paul know that he was from Macedonia? Probably because he was dressed like a Macedonian. Uh, he would be... Uh, the Macedonians were, were a, Roman, a Roman area at this time, but previously they were a Greek territory, a Greek nation. They were under the influence. Macedonia, uh, you've heard of Philip of Macedonia. That's Philip would be, would be Alexander the Great's father, would have, would have resettled the city of Philippi in Macedonia, the chief city of Macedonia. So, so you probably recognized them, that he was from Macedonia because of the way he dressed, etc., and prayed him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia and help us. That's a great, I've heard. Yeah, the Macedonian call today, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. So this man from Macedonia ha has this message from Paul. The Spirit had stopped him from going into the regions north, and now here he was in Troas and has this vision, help us. Oh boy, did, the, did they need help in Macedonia. Macedonia, again, if we look at the city, if, when we look further and see what happened on, in, in Philippi, the chief city of Macedonia, 
what the first thing we find out, and I've always overlooked this before, is on the Sabbath day, Paul was hanging around by a river. He wasn't a synagogue. Philippi had, had no Jewish or hardly any Jewish influence, unlike all the other cities that Paul would go to in, in, in his journeys. So they had something even greater. We need help. We don't even have the Jews' religion in the area. We have no semblance. We have nothing but paganism in Philippi. An interesting, and in, in Philippi, notice what it says here in verse number... Uh, actually, let me go further here. Uh, it says, come over into Macedonia and help us. Verse 10 says, and after he had seen the vision immediately... Circle the next word after immediately. Immediately, we. You know, an interesting thing happens here because now we enter the, we enter the author. We enter Luke. Here in Acts chapter 16, start, the rest of this chapter is full of we instead of talking third person about Paul. On the third missionary journey, Paul would go back. He'd go into Ephesus and then go back into Philippi. And then again, the we verses start from chapters 20 to the end. So Luke was in the company of Paul at the time of this vision of the Macedonian man. And it's amazing how much that we don't know about Luke. The only thing we know in the scriptures about him is, is his introductions to the book of Acts and, and the introduction to the, the, the gospel of Luke as well. But Paul, at the end of his ministry, would give Luke uh, much uh, more, what's the, what's the word, cred. He'd have more credibility, more uh, publicity Let's go over to uh, Col Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. I think it's interesting when you see the sudden change from, from a third person to first person, and Luke interjects himself into the narrative right at the time of the vision of the man of Macedonia. Another question to ask yourself, and we don't really have the answer, could this man of Macedonia that Paul saw, could that have been Luke? One question. Nobody really knows. Because again, not much is known of, of Luke, that only that he was a doctor. He was a, a physician. He was an impeccable historian throughout the years. His, his writings are just full of so much detail that they cannot be denied. Colossians chapter 4. I think I, I covered this kind of thoroughly back, back when we were in Colossians. But Colossians chapter 4, down to verse number... Let's just go to uh, ver verse 14. Luke... The beloved physician and Demas greet you. Simply, there was Paul, there was Luke with him at, towards the end of his ministry there in Colossae. They, uh, they, they give him, or not in Colossae, but right, being written to the Colossians, I believe from Ephesus at this time. There was Luke that was with him, greeting him with him, the beloved physician. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse number 9. Now remember in Colossians, we saw not only Luke, but we saw Demas. We see Demas again here along with Luke. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me. Wait a minute, Demas was just being condemned, I mean, uh, commended before, now he's forsaken him. Why? Having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, 
Crescens to Galatia, Titus into Dalmatia. By the, uh, I believe Dalmatia, that's the same, same area as Alicrium uh, as well, on, the, on the, what is now Croatia. That would have been the old region of Dalmatia as well. Look at verse number 11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So only Luke is left. And Paul is telling, telling Timothy now to take the once cast out Mark with him. He's profitable unto me. One more place, uh, Philemon. Right after, right after Titus. Let's go down to verse 22. But with all, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So there's Luke. There's Luke in the midst. And then we have him in the book of Acts. Again, if you re look at the we's in chapter 16, those we's disappear after Paul leaves Philippi. And the word on the street, I hate that, the word on the street is that, is that Luke stayed in Philippi until Paul came back through Philippi and took him for the rest of his ministry after that. I think it's pretty amazing how that happens. This man of Macedonia, and then suddenly the we verses appear, and Luke is on the scene, having not only, not only the historical evidence that he had gathered from Scripture, gathered historical accounts, interviewed actual people that were involved with the birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. He was the greatest historian of all, but at this time, he becomes embedded. I think of that, the embedded reporters that are, that are with troops. They're right on the front lines saying what's happened. This, this apostle Paul, he's real. And what he's doing is real. His ministry was real. I was there. Not only did I report everything, but I was there with him. So his words are even more astounding for us today. So back to Acts chapter 16. Verse number 9 again. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us, those of us that are here in Macedonia. And they passing by Mycia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Oh, I already read that. Uh, verse number 10. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now, remember what I said, some people have a viewpoint that this, this vision that he saw was, was Luke. But look at, the diff, look, at, look at what it says here. We immediately, we endeavored to go into Macedonia. In other words, they, they put the greatest importance of getting over to Macedonia. This vision was so much that they were compelled to go assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So this vision that Paul had, was it Luke, as some would say? But he says, assuredly, we know that the Lord called us. Now, Paul, of all people, how, how many times did the Lord appear unto Paul himself? This vision he had, I would say by the scriptures, was not Luke, but this vision he had 
was unmistakably to Paul was Jesus Christ himself. He was there, Paul. Think back. Saul, why do you kick against the goads? Paul, why do you persecute me? So here was the one that Paul had persecuted before. Paul going into heavy-duty training in the gospel ministry through years now has a verification from the Lord himself that, yes, I stopped you from going into Bithynia and Cappadocia and Pontus. There is a foundation there, and those areas will once again be prominent when the Lord begins his, his return, when he, when he comes again, those areas are going to be prominent during the end times. They're not right now. They're just wasteland. I don't even know what they have from major ports in the Black Sea up there. But the, the reality, we think of that region as been just being a, a wasteland of a war and strife. Uh, the empires that have taken that region over so much. But that will come into play one day. And now meanwhile, Paul goes into Philippi. In verse number 11, Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samo, Thracia, and the next day to Neapolis. Try saying that one a few times fast. Samo Thracia. Samo Thracia was an island off the coast of Macedonia and Thrace. Thrace is a region which is now part of Turkey today. This would be the, the western side of the, Ist, the Bosphorus Strait. Uh, this is where, where Istanbul, again, Istanbul, not Con Constantinople, Byzantium would be in the Straits of the Bosphorus going from, uh, going into the, the Black Sea. So this area now used to be called Thrace. That's why, uh, that's why uh, this island is, is Samothrace. It was a region of Thrace, but it was an island. It was direct access about 100 miles off the coast of Troas. So when they would stop there, I don't know, they didn't have to refuel or anything, but they would go straight there, stick around there for a little bit of time, uh, and the next day to Neapolis. Neapolis sounds like it would be a modern place today. There is actually a modern port there in ancient Neapolis. Neapolis would be the port city that would... That would uh, be the port of Philippi. So they went right into, from Samothracia into to Neapolis, and then from thence to Philippi. I'm going to end up with its closing in verse 12 here. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. See, we, we think of colonies as being like the 13 colonies, a giant region. What a, what, a, what a colony was in this place, Ephesus was also a colony, so to speak. Philippi, again, has been around for a long, long time. We think of our ancient history in the United States of 200 and some odd years. But, but Philippi, again, was named Philippi after, after Philip the Macedonian, the father of Alexander. He had, he had re-inhabited it there and, and built it up, and then Alexander would then build it up even more into the great city it was. Well, around, the, around 300 B.C., the Romans would take it over. It's pretty interesting how that happened because it was Mark Antony that, that would, and Octavius that would, would take over the, the Greek region in, in that area, and they would settle in Philippi, and they would have a great building progress. Uh, process and they would build it up into the super city that it was at the time. Uh, again, still no Jewish influence whatsoever there. And then the Romans would hold it until, until about 200 AD. In between, in between, it would be a great Christian center through the ministry of Paul. 
But then later, now the ruins are there of Philippi, some wonderful ruins of their, of their stadium and all these different things. Looks like a typical Roman city after it was rebuilt by the, Rome, by, by the Romans. But it was a colony. You know, read that when you see colony in the New Testament. Read retirement center for old war vets. <laughs> That's what Ephesus was too, and, and, and to some degree as well. You find that in Revelation chapter 2. So it became a colony. Think of, I think of Colony Retirement Center here in Worcester. So all these old Roman war veterans would, would settle there. I think Alexandria, Virginia is kind of similar to that for us today. We could call that a colony one day because of all the uh, retired CIA agents on every corner. But that would be what, what Philippi would be like. So in that part of Macedonia and a colony and we were in that city certain days. We were in there for several months in Philippi. And boy, did that several months have impact. I said, this is largely a historical narrative. We often hear the term, the, the, the Macedonian call today. The heart of it's there. But it was a historical thing that happened to Paul. He had a vision. I looked at Macedonian call, it's great in our, our songs and everything, our desire to bring the gospel. It's amazing how many wacko charismatics have claimed to have similar visions. They've received their own Macedonian call. And uh, God showed me himself. God appeared to me. God didn't appear to these guys. He did appear to Paul, because Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ ordained completely by Jesus Christ. As one born out of due time, Jesus appeared to him, and he was used mightily to spread the gospel. Now, verse number 13, and his will, we'll pick it up next week. This is the segue of the segue. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the woman which resorted thither. And I, uh, it's funny, I have an old note that I put. I put, where were the men? I put, maybe in the synagogue. No, there were no synagogues. I have to revise my old ancient note that it was there. There were no synagogues in Philippi. So they were, they were there, and this was entirely new revelation for the people of Philippi. And the rest of the chapter, you'll see the victory and defeat of the pagan gods that were, that were knocked out by the gospel message. And that message is still the same today. No other god can help you. No other, no other thing can get, out, get to you. There is one God, Jesus Christ, one Savior, Jesus Christ. One spirit, the spirit of God, that fills us. I almost came up with a, a thing that fills us, that thrills us, and, and that gives us the confidence we have, not in what we do, not in our accomplishments, but it gives us the, these words that we can, we can just wonder at. It's okay to question what the Bible says. It's okay, because he desires us to, to look into these things and understand them more and more. His desire is for us today is not to get knocked on the head by a vision, but to study, to show thyselves approved. Boy, I was dry. As a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. So as we look through Acts, again, as we continue looking through, it's primarily, I almost said primordially, uh, primarily historical in nature. It gives what the, the history, Luke himself, given the history that, that is non-negotiable and that we can look back to. And that history is as real today as it was when it was written. 
Amen? The whole message through it all, as we'll see, is people trusting the Lord through it all. Pagan cultures coming to the Lord, trusting in what He did on the cross of Calvary. That's our hope today. Years I spent in vanity and pride. But now, I can't remember the words. Knowing that, my Lord was crucified. Amen? That's our hope. When we see the things happening around the world today, there's nothing new. Absolutely nothing novel about anything today. It's all the same old news of a world that hates the Lord and will do anything to diminish His power, His glory, His majesty, and, and cast fear and dispersion on everyone. I'm so thankful. I, I, sa I saw a, a thing that said, you know, we don't have to worry about anything because the Lord is on His throne still. I said, that sounded good, but it's not really accurate though. Jesus is not on His throne right now. He's in His throne in heaven. He's making intercession for us. He's got the whole world before Him. He knows exactly what's going on today. And He knows that one day He will be rolling on a throne on earth, bringing in a system, His own system. You know, think again, th again go back to the, uh, the book of Exodus, Exodus 19 promised, the, tr promised Israel, those who would believe they would be a kingdom of priests. That was their promise. That was, the, that was for the nation of Israel. And one day, Jesus is going to return and it will be that kingdom of priests on this earth. Not just in heaven, but on earth. It will all take place.